Hello, Costas. It's uh, quite a while that we uh, talked before on this topic, uh, sure. and I'm very happy to uh, have the opportunity to interview you on uh, this topic. Um, maybe a short word about myself for uh, the viewers uh, of, of this uh, interview. Uh, I am uh, an innovation manager working at the University Library of uh, Maastricht University uh, with special attention for the role of the library in the context of uh, OER, Open Educational Resources and Digital Accessibility. Um, and I'm also the project leader of uh, an Edisources project, uh, which is focusing on uh, infrastructure for uh, storing and sharing uh, educational material. Um, I'm also a member of the European Network of Open Educational Libraries, and uh, this network is engaging in a number of uh, open education, in, education capacity and support building activities. Um, one of which is called the European Open Education Champions. And that's why we got to you, because we know that you are working in this field already for uh, a couple of years. Um, we are interviewing important uh, open education advocates uh, and actors. Um, um, and well, uh, first I want to ask you to briefly present yourself and if Maybe this could also connect to uh, what is your connection or what is uh, your work with open educational resources or open pedagogy in a more broadly way. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me for, uh, for this interview, Gabby. Uh, I'm Kostas Papadopoulos. I'm an assistant professor in digital humanities and cultural studies in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Maastricht University. Um, I have a background in archaeology, but I have specialized in digital archaeology, uh, primarily in the field of uh, virtual pasts, including 3D visualization and virtual reality, to see how we can use uh, the so-called modern technologies uh, as a way to better understand and interpret uh, facets of the past that may be unknown uh, nowadays. Mm -hmm. And my uh, research has essentially two strands. Uh, one, the one that I just said on uh, uh, 3D visualization uh, that started much earlier. Uh, but then from 2015, I have also been working on uh, open educational resources, and that was when I joined uh, Maynooth University in Ireland, so uh, long before uh, I came to the, to the Netherlands. And it, was, it started with a, with a project that was about uh, building a, a platform for open educational resources for the digital arts and humanities, uh, what uh, is called and is known as uh, Daria Teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the platform we already had a couple of conversations about. Yes. Um, when you started this platform and, and uh, open educational resources for the platform, uh, did librarians support you in that job? Um, no, unfortunately not. And I'm saying unfortunately because libraries are uh, like major advocates of uh, open education, open source and so forth, especially in the States, probably in Europe a bit less. Uh, but no, uh, we did not have, uh, you know, support in the strict sense uh, from, uh, uh, from a library. Mm -hmm. And you said, unfortunately, were, were there topics or activities uh, you uh, ran into for which you could have used the support of a library? library? Um, well, I think it's uh, both when it comes to, uh, well, expertise uh, that libra librarians have, especially in digital humanities, we work and discuss a lot of issues that have to do with uh, archiving, for example, preservation, and I think uh, libraries have a big say in that, and probably they are uh, more uh, knowledgeable than uh, many other people in the field who talk about these things, also because it comes from, from their own practice. Uh, essentially. So uh, I think it would have been uh, really 
uh, useful uh, to have a more, uh, let's say, active conversation or active contribution uh, by uh, librarians. But of course, I have to say, we did have discussions with, uh, with li librarians. Of course, it was not something that uh, uh, was developed completely outside mm -hmm. and separately from the library world. But mm -hmm. you know what, what I'm talking here about is a, a kind of a more active involvement and contribution. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that connects also to the moment in which we uh, had this conversation. We were actually um, in, inquiring requirements for people like you uh, working on, on, on uh, projects like these uh, and, and what could we offer as a library for you. So at a certain point we met, but we did not really participate yet. So. Mm, yeah. Um, but the program is running and you have this platform and you created uh, open educational uh, materials for, for your students. Um, who do you think benefited most from uh, this project or this platform? Well, uh, just to give you a bit of context and, uh, you know, explain why we developed this open ed educational resource. So, uh, first of all, uh, to say that uh, the first project was originally funded by, so the first phase of the project was funded by an Erasmus Plus grant and the PI of the project was uh, Susan Schreibman back then uh, was also uh, in Ireland, now also in Maastricht. Um, uh, and then, of course, there were other collaborators in lots of different, uh, lots of different countries. Um, so the reasoning behind this platform was that in the digital humanities, uh, we develop lots of workshops and training activities. Uh, and we give them in, uh, let's say, workshops, uh, summer schools and so forth. But actually, there's no... Uh, well, on the one hand, there's no place uh, to put all these resources, so each one produces their own and maybe they're on a hard drive, uh, maybe some may put those on, um, you know, SlideShare or on some other sharing services, but typically you wouldn't find at least easily uh, online unless you contact directly that person. Uh, and of course, there are many who haven't studied digital humanities and they want to, let's say, upskill or to take up. Uh, they want to enhance their digital skills and they're trying to find uh, resources to do that. And of course, uh, the other thing has to do um, with, uh, let's say, uh, to what extent uh, these resources are, uh, uh, let me say, trustful in a way. So they are of uh, some quality of some standards. Uh, they are pegged to, you know, certain educational requirements and systems, uh, you know, things like ECTS and so forth. So what we tried to do in direct teach was to give a more formal uh, structure around these resources, both as a uh, place to uh, create them and host them, but also uh, to, to have them um, uh, in a way speak to some European standards. Uh, we thought that these two were, uh, were really important. So when it comes to our, to our audience, uh, our audience was and still is, uh, on the one hand could be lone learners, so mm -hmm. somebody who just wants to take up uh, or have some interest, uh, teachers, uh, who may want to use these in their classrooms with the students and also just uh, uh, students themselves or any other uh, any other uh, person or stakeholder who may have some interest mm -hmm. uh, in these uh, areas we cover. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing just to say uh, for the resources that we're developing is that it's not that we're putting PDFs online. And I think that's the main difference. What we have been doing in Daria Teach is that we construct the whole course. Uh, and uh, these are courses that uh, are taken in, a, in an uh, asynchronous way. Mm -hmm. So it's not like MOOCs where we say it runs from you know, uh, the 15th to the 20th of September and will be there to support you. You will be able to ask questions and so forth. It's exactly the opposite. So they are available um, always. Of course, they are for free. So they are accessible to everybody. Um, and 
uh, you can actually go through the course yourself. Uh, courses are divided into sections, into pages, into chapters, like what you would get in a, uh, like in a book, but not in a book format, of course. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of different ways to, um, in a way, check yourself and check your knowledge, your understanding. We have developed quizzes, interactive content. Uh, we have recorded lots of videos, but they are not video based as the uh, as the MOOCs are. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of text, there's lots of theory, there's lots of uh, uh, sources and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's an amalgamation of uh, different modalities uh, of content and also for um, a, a, an amalgamation also of theory and uh, and practice. Mm -hmm. And and uh, do you know of uh, experiences of participants, uh, either students or teaching staff? Well, so Daria Teach has um, has been used a lot, and I can give you some examples. Mm -hmm. No, not everything probably, uh, because I think uh, there are too many. And probably I will start with the more uh, recent ones, especially during COVID. Uh, so uh, we used uh, certain uh, courses we developed on direct teach with our students uh, here at Master University in the form of flipped classroom. So it was, uh, we used these courses as a way to, for example, introduce uh, theory. So uh, Susan Schreibman um, has one uh, course in the master's uh, called Design Thinking Maker Culture and a certain course in, um, um, in direct teach was used to introduce the theory uh, of design thinking. Um, and also in one of the courses uh, I taught uh, together with Susan, which was about creating digital collections, uh, we used one course that I developed on Daria Teach as a way to introduce the more practical elements of the digitization process. Mm -hmm. So it was always used as a flipped classroom in this case. So students uh, would um, do this as a, we would assign the open resources as a reading. Mm -hmm. And then students will do that at their own pace at home, and then will come back in class and essentially apply their knowledge and, and skills they obtain through the direct teach courses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, also, um, we ran because uh, in the second phase of direct teach, uh, we, which is called Ignite, just finished a few months ago. Um, but uh, what we did is that we developed additional courses to um, uh, probably uh, this time targeting more the cultural and creative industries uh, and particularly students master, uh, at master's level uh, who do not have access to or they don't have adequate uh, technical skills. Um, and what we did is that we ran several uh, events, uh, both a summer school and an autumn school, and we used uh, Daria Teach as the curriculum for, uh, for these schools and for these master classes. And what was really impressive is that we had, uh, and of course they were online uh, mm -hmm. because of COVID, they were mm -hmm. also uh, uh, free uh, for everyone to attend. And what was really impressive is that we had people coming from all over the world, uh, people who uh, they wouldn't have the chance uh, to do otherwise. They wouldn't mm -hmm. have the chance to maybe follow formal education. Or if, we or if we would have done these events physically, probably they wouldn't have been able to travel from Australia, for yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, well, I hear, a, I hear a lot of benefits already. <laughs> um, 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 referring to your examples, uh, can you see some key successes for the open education uh, based on your experience? Well, one other thing that uh, it may be worth uh, highlighting is that, so I gave you some examples where we have used Daria Teach with our students, but also with learners more generally. So also we have tried to use uh, direct it's with professionals uh, from the creative and cultural industry. So we're expanding our audiences. However, I think what has been really interesting is that we had some examples of um, uh, collaborators who were not part of the, of the original uh, uh, grants, but uh, in a way, joined uh, Daria Teach uh, later. Um, 
so we do have uh, an example of a professor from Hungary who actually co-developed a course with his students. Uh, and also we have a very nice example from Spain, a professor uh, in digital humanities who used our existing courses on Daria Tietz as a course assignment to translate those into Spanish. Mm -hmm. So to reach uh, also a much wider audience. Yep. So yep. I think one of the kind of the successes is that it has general, generated lots of different audiences and lots of different uses, probably uh, beyond what we, uh, let's say, originally planned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so I think that's, uh, that's one thing. Yeah, yeah, you're expanding the community, so to say. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. Yeah, and um, well, this this all all um, all sounds very successful, but uh, did you encounter things uh, which uh, still need to be done for making it more open or better embedded? Well, uh, yes, I think one of the major challenges uh, we face, uh, not only in this project, but I think in open education in general, is that, well, depending uh, what kind of open educational resources you, uh, you create, because it's one thing putting my PowerPoints online, for example, or my syllabus online, I think that's one thing. But uh, what we're trying to do, which is essentially creating a whole course online that can be followed without the instructor being there, uh, I think that's more challenging because it requires uh, resources mm -hmm. and resources means, of course, time. Uh, quite often it means help and money, but also I think it requires institutional support because, of course, the question is, well, why should I spend a month uh, of my time uh, to do that if my institution is not going to recognize it, if it's not going to recognize it as a, as a valid output? Mm -hmm. Because quite often, you know, we give emphasis to uh, teaching and to education uh, and student satisfaction. But of course, when we produce these teaching materials counts as, you know, um, as, as part of our of our daily job, but it requires lots of time and effort. And it's not as uh, easy as it may sound or as easy as it is, for example, to create a PowerPoint presentation. Yep. So it requires more effort and resources. And I think we're not uh, yet doing well in recognizing these outputs as, for example, we would recognize um, a journal article. Mm -hmm. or um, uh, you know a chapter in an edited volume mm -hmm. so i think one step is the recognition from uh, our institution and i think uh, uh, to be very honest master university is doing uh, really well especially with the initiatives uh, you know the uh, awards and and recognitions uh, that more kind of atypical outputs are recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think in general, as, a, as an academic community, where, where they are yet. Yeah, well, that, that's, uh, maybe it's good to know that uh, I started, um, uh, well, to have the conversation with the open science community within our university, uh, because I also noted this test that uh, it's not yet part of the recognition and reward initiatives to uh, pay attention to uh, education or open educational resources as such so hopefully we can uh, continue this conversation and make it work and i i, I think i'm going to uh, come back to you for that as well in the future um, but this is part of uh, the project which uh, i just mentioned before uh, we started with the edu sources project mm -hmm. uh, on the one side we're uh, going to create the infrastructure for uh, sharing or storing and sharing material uh, but we are also um, well tr trying to make this topic uh, better known within universities so I'll make people aware of the possibilities of uh, open educational resources uh, next to or instead of uh, other material uh, but also well how you could benefit from it yeah so this is good to know that uh, this is also a point which you note as very important. Um, what are your plans for the future? Well, um, well, uh, I would say one of the things has to do, of course, with uh, funding. So we should look for uh, and we're actively looking for other uh, 
sources of uh, funding to uh, further develop our, our platform. Uh, we have also uh, spent quite some time and energy uh, and of course part of our budget from uh, the previous grant uh, also to redesign the interface because also interfaces are really uh, important in open education. I think uh, we have to compete with uh, you know, big names and big platforms uh, that uh, have uh, very user-friendly interfaces as well. So I think um, we need to also uh, do something towards uh, that respect when it comes to open education interfaces. Um, and of course, I think one of the other goals is to uh, expand our, our audience. So uh, both geographically, uh, I think, because uh, quite often we see that these materials, we get statistics, so these materials are used um, uh, from, well, uh, Europeans and North America uh, as well, but I think uh, we have to do some extra work and effort to also uh, involve others that are probably less represented or have less opportunities mm -hmm. um, in, in education. Uh, I think also expanding in terms of uh, who, who uses this material in terms of professions. Mm -hmm. So we have started already um, uh, working with uh, museum professionals, for example, uh, in heritage who would like to uh, expand their skill sets, let's say. So I think that's uh, definitely uh, another aim. And of course, it's uh, more and more to um, work with educators, with teachers, uh, to demonstrate how we have used those in our classes and how they could use those in our, in our classes. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, expand the audience by also doing other things, including uh, translations, for example, or having others not part of our, of our original uh, team to develop their own courses uh, as well. So these are all uh, plans and some of these we're doing at a smaller scale, especially when uh, the funding has ended, of course, it's more of a on, on a volunteering uh, basis. Yeah. So it's more difficult to progress quickly. But uh, definitely, uh, this is something that we are uh, definitely looking forward to continue working mm -hmm. on. Uh, Maybe it's good to take a look at the incentive scheme the Dutch government uh, already launched, but you probably know of that uh, already. I do, so, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have some last remarks which you want to share with us uh, for for uh, well an audience you did not reach yet? And uh, well, I mean, I think. Uh, we should be working with open educational resources. I think as educators, uh, we need to um, like give it as an example, uh, uh, publish our teaching material, uh, communicate our work to uh, a wide audience as wide as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think if we start showing that yes it can be done yes we're doing it i think more and more people will start uh, uh, also contributing to the open education movement and i think if more people can see the value of this i think then there will be more resources generated for that there will be more institutional support and more people uh, joining the open movement yeah Thank you. Well, I will definitely come back uh, to you uh, when we start uh, really the project. And um, well, um, thanks again for uh, being here and uh, this uh, great conversation we had on this topic. Uh, I definitely hope this is not the last one we have a conversation about this. And uh, well, I'm looking forward to share this interview with the OE community uh, and uh, the network. Um, and uh, I want to uh, um, say goodbye to you all. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. having me here. Thank you, Gabby.